Well, tonight I'm going to test how much all of you really want to know about the Holy Spirit. I think there's some people that would rather not know about this aspect of the Holy Spirit, that he convicts, that he brings conviction. I think that's something that some people would rather not think about. Conviction! Conviction is being made up, made to face up with personal guilt. Conviction. Conviction is being made to acknowledge that one is entirely in the wrong. Conviction. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Now let's think about some places where conviction can take place. Now you know some words that are related to conviction, by the way, are like convict. That's related. That's the same word. Same root. Think about that. Convict somebody that's in prison. Conviction. Now some places where conviction can take place, it can take place before an earthly judgment seat, or it can take place before the judgment of the great day, or as we're going to speak about tonight, it can take place and your own heart and conscience. Conviction. And we ought to thank God for this aspect of conviction. Amen. Now I'm going to talk about some re re relevant current uh, day scenarios in the church that make for conviction. I mean, if we, we might as well talk about things that make for conviction. There's no sense in talking about conviction if if we don't convict anybody. See, but, but my purpose is not necessarily to step on toes, but if I do, I'm doing it impersonally. So, so don't take it personal, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you something. <clears throat> I know most of you have read the book of Job. And... For a long time, I looked at the book of Job a certain way, and, and in the last year or so, I've come to see it a different way. You know, Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Zophar, Naaman, whatever you think about them. Now, God... God called them into judgment because they misassessed Job's case. But they were able to talk intelligently about their God. Amen. And they did this in a time when there was very little revelation. They were able to talk, and they were, that's what they came to talk about. They didn't come to talk about sports. They came to talk about their God. And they came to talk intelligently about their God. Now, how much more should people in the church today be able to talk intelligently about their God? How much more? I ask you. Conviction. But see, in the, we ought to not only talk about, be able to talk about him, he is the joy. He ought to be the joy and the rejoicing of all of our hearts. And, and I know in, in most of the cases he is. So I'm just, don't take it personal if it's not personal. See? But I'm just, uh, you see what I'm saying? This is a very real, there's some people when the service is over that they just go back to talking about the basketball game or whatever. See, that's not good. That's not good. See, Watch, see ought that you know, this is an index. That's an index that something's not right. Not saying basketball games are bad. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying that the knowledge of God, it's far superior. It's not worthy to be compared with any of the trash that's in earth. Amen. Not worthy to be compared. Now here's another scenario for conviction. In the churches in the land, you listen to people make prayer requests. And it seems like the main objective in the prayer request, when you look at the whole picture, I'm talking about, you know, wherever you're at, is that people are really asking for things to, to return to a state of normalcy. 
We want things to get back to normal like they normally are down here in Earth, see? Well, maybe that's not God's purpose. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think that maybe God is bringing you to heaven? And this is a, and this is a very, this is a very diverse transition. Maybe he's bringing you through to, through a trial. Maybe that's why. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't pray for people that are sick, but I'm, I'm just asking you to think about things like this. I'm just asking you to think about what the things that we pray about. Now, here's another scenario. Religious chatter. You hear a lot of religious chatter in the churches. Now, what I'm calling religious chatter is what, where people are talking religion, but their understanding's not fruitful and their heart's not involved. Well, they ought to be quiet. See, and they ought to, they ought to, they ought to draw near to God. I mean, if these are people that are actually reconciled to God, let them draw near to God and let them, let them, let them get their hearts right with God. See, because they've got some wonderful things to talk about. But one, we've got some, brethren, we've got some wonderful things to talk about. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Let's do it, let's, let, and let's get the message out to us. Let, let, see, I'm not, I'm not beating you over the head. I'm just saying, I'm just kind of speaking my heart. See, we, let's, get, let's, let's get rid of the religious chatter where people don't have an understanding of God and where their heart's not involved, where their heart's not connected with their mouth. See, that's religious chatter. Now our text uh, tonight, see I put all the applications at the front, see now we're going to deal with the text, so. <laughs> and that's in John chapter 16. So I'll let you think about the applications as we go through. And for a long time this has been a favorite text of mine and it's been an intriguing text to my own heart. But I just confess to you that I'm just an earthen vessel. And uh, we'll do the best we can. But Jesus says, nevertheless, ne the best we can by the grace of God, see. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Think about that word expedient for you. Now, I like to think about words like this. You to, let's all of us resolve to just get, take these words into our own heart. Let's think about each word here. Let's think about what the Lord is actually saying here. Now what he's actually saying here is it's better for you that I've gone away. Do you, do you, do you, are you able to think that way? Matter of, it's, or we could say it's, it's actually more advantageous to you that I'm going to go back to heaven. See, it's, it's better for you that I'm not here. I mean, in the body. It's going to be more advantageous. Now, I, what I'm asking you to do, brethren, is, is to make that to be part of your thinking and your heart's thinking processes. It's better that he's gone away. And we'll, we'll follow the reasoning through what he says here. Now, he was speaking first, most of all, uh, here to the apostles. That was the primary, he, the, the apostles. And I'll, let me just tell, let me digress. Brother Kenny likes to digress a lot, but we'll, I'm going to digress for a moment here. This was actually the, uh, this is the Lord's table. This is the Last Supper. Think about it this way. This was Jesus, especially chapter 13 and 14. See, and at the end of 14, it says, let's rise, let's go up and go someplace else. But 
But chapters 13 and 14, see, this, uh, this particularly was the, uh, the time, the last time that the Lord was together with his apostles. It's a tender time. I'll tell you, brethren, it's a tender time. You want to think of the Lord. See, he, he loved his 12 apostles. He's 11 at this point, but, but he loved them. See, and it's a time of great tenderness. This time when they, when they were around the table with him, it's a time of great tenderness, see. But the Holy Spirit, if you'll, if you'll let him, see, he can transport you back to that table like you're just sitting right at the table with him. Yes. He can do that, see. Or he can, he, can just, he, can, he can make a table for you in the midst of your enemies, too, see. But I'm just, we're talking about things that the Holy Spirit is able to do. The Holy Spirit was given to the apostles in great measure. They, as it were, stood in the Savior's, Savior's stead, empowered from on high, as they went into all the world to preach the gospel. But the Holy Spirit is given to us as well, who have received the Savior. Make no mistake about it. You remember Peter on the day of Pentecost. Now this is one that... Everybody in the Christian churches ought to be able to quote, but this is Acts 2.38, but I mean, this is a, we don't want this to become like a, a denominational text. This is the truth. See, this is a, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and, ye shall, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what he said to all of them. That's what he said to the ones that, that crucified the Lord. See? So it doesn't really matter what you've done. See? It doesn't matter what your past is. See? He'll say that to you too. And we'll say that to you too. <clears throat> but it is more advantageous for us and for the kingdom of God's sake that Jesus has ascended up on high. It really is. It's an, we're, really, we're really advantaged because he's gone. Now that almost sounds like almost blasphemy to say it that way. But see, but if he, if he did not go away, the comforter would not come, see? So what I'm asking you, and I know, I know that you, most of you have all read these things, but I'm, I'm asking you to take a step further and to make this to be a part of your thinking process. This is, so these thoughts are actually coursing not only through your mind, but also through your heart. You want to think about these things all the time. Think about them, brethren. Now is the advantage of which he is speaking here an integral part of our thought and reasoning processes? That's what we've got to ask one another. Let's state this another way. The Savior has gone away into heaven, and this circumstance has created a singular advantage for those who are living by faith. That's what he said. That's what Jesus said. Now, I'm summarizing what he said, but that's what, that's what he said. He has ascended up on high that he might fill all things, and he is now able to mightily work in and through Everyone whose heart is perfect towards him. Amen. It's expedient for you. It's better for you. It's more advantageous for you, as we've said. It's more profitable for you. It is that which gives believing men the, spirit, the, the spiritual edge on things. That's what gives us the edge. Because Jesus has gone away and the comforter has come. See, that's why we have the edge. See, if we walk in the spirit, see. As long as we walk in this, as we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, we'll skip down here. We're gonna we're gonna run out of time. I can see. This this, and it, you'll notice that this distinction about him going away and the comforter coming this is something that Jesus this is something that Jesus talked about several times throughout this discourse see this is not just this particular time so
So uh, it seems that the Savior is perhaps saying here that perhaps that only one member of the Godhead can be upon earth at one time, perhaps. Or perhaps two members of the Godhead have to be in heaven at all times. Or that Jesus had to ascend up to the right hand of God before the Holy Spirit could be sent forth. See? I think the third one is the, makes, more, makes more sense. But this is the, we're all in the, realm of, we're in the realm of holy speculation here, so whatever the reason, we will simply draw your attention to the fact that the Lord emphatically declares that the Comforter would not come unless he went away. See? So we'll leave it right there and we'll let you be the judges of, of what, uh, what the involvements are. Now let's uh, go on further to this word, the comforter. We will probably make this uh, point more than once, but the Holy Spirit is called the comforter or the paraclete or one that comes by your side to assist and to help on the way to heaven. And he is called the comforter because he has been appointed to console believing men and women in the absence of the Savior. Now can you see that? A lot of people... <clears throat> You see, a lot of people, they think about the Holy Spirit as just somebody who's come to give them a good feeling while they're here in this world. But see, it's a lot more than that. He's come because Jesus has gone away. Can you see that? He's, he, we, because Jesus himself was a comforter. Remember, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you another comforter, implying that he himself is a comforter, see? And when he went away, See, there was a need for a comforter. We, we, we stood desperately in need of a comforter when Jesus went away. Can you see that? I don't, now, I just all, maybe I'm being rep repetitive, but see, you, I, want this, I want this thinking to become part of your thinking. Uh, your th as, you, as you think about this, see, don't just take my words for it, but just you think about what the Lord Jesus is saying here. <clears throat> The Comforter was going to come because the Savior was going to weigh, going away. And he, this word, depart, he said, uh, I, think, uh, I think of this uh, place in Luke chapter 17 and verse 22. He said unto the disciples, the days will come when you'll desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you won't see it. See? I'm asking you, do you have that kind of yearning for the Son of Man? Because he's, he's absent now in, this, in the sense that Jesus is talking about. And the Comforter has come, see? But, but see, he's come to comfort us in the absence of the Savior, see? See the point that I'm making? Now let's move on here, John chapter 16 and verse 8, it says, And when he is come, the comforter, he will reprove. That almost sounds like a contradiction. Did you ever think about that? Comforter's coming and he's going to reprove. I ask you about that. The same Spirit who is the Comforter is also the divinely appointed reprover of men. The one who ministers everlasting consolations and good hope to some men is also the one who ministers great reproofs and conviction to other men. Same Spirit. This is the same Spirit. On the individual level, before the comforter, uh, before he was the comforter to men, he was the great reprover. Just think in your own life's experience. When you were still outside of the Savior, he was to you a reprover. He goaded you, goaded you all the way. See, made you feel guilty. See, that's his ministry. That's the Holy Spirit's ministry. See, to make you feel guilty, so you'll you'll want to come to the Savior. 
But see, but see he was, before he was the comforter to you, he was the reprover. He comforts where he has previously reproved, and he reproves with the intent of intention, eventually comforting men who have not yet believed, and who shall believe unto who yet shall believe unto life everlasting. See, we know this because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, and the Holy Spirit, he, 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 is, his, he has the same mind. He has precisely the same mind. Now here's a, some conviction here. When the comforter is come, he will reprove. The greater part of the reproving and convicting done by him is done through the hearts and lives of those who he indwells. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stress this, but I want you to think about that. You see if there's any place where he doesn't. You think about that. Let me say that again. The greater part of the reproving and convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit is done through the hearts and lives of those whom he indwells. Can you think of any place where he convicted anyone apart from the word of God and the word of God being preached? Can you think of any chapters in the book of Acts that are devoted exclusively to the Holy Spirit. Now I can think of a chapters that are devoted to Stephen and to Paul and to Peter and to other of the, of the brethren, but can you think of chapters? Is there like a, a chapter 29 and on that's just the Holy Spirit? Oh, we're gonna answer that question. I'm just asking you to think about it. The great awakenings and revivals in history were sparked either by some men who were intently considering the word of God or by men and women who were living and walking in the spirit. They were involved. Amen. They were involved. See, the, the Holy Spirit will not swoop down from heaven and bring salvation to men independent of the involvement of other men with God. He won't. Remember Paul, he says, we're ministers by whom you have believed. That's how he works. This is how the Holy Spirit works. He doesn't work independent of other men. But see what that, well, just think about how we fit in there. I'm going to challenge you in just a few moments. When the comforter, when the comforter comes, he will reprove, he will convict, he will con work conviction in men's hearts. In creation, the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, but now he moves upon the field of men's hearts. The Holy Spirit does not reprove birds and oxen and trees. He works conviction in the hearts of those who are created in God's image. Return, you children of men. And when the comforter, these, uh, this matter of comforting and reproving, these almost appear to be contradictory, as we've said, but to those who have obeyed the gospel and who are living by faith, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And his primary minister, ministry to them is, is one of comfort and consolation. He comforts them by counseling them in the truth. He doesn't comfort just by giving you a good feeling, like you just, I don't really know where it came from. And all of a sudden, I had a comforting feeling. No, that's not how the Holy Spirit comforts. He comforts you by your understanding of the truth. He enlivens that. See, as you, as you devote yourself to God's word, see, he'll, he makes it alive in your heart. That's how he comforts. That's the way the Holy Spirit comforts. Where truth is understood clearly by man and where there, is a, where there is agreement with it, there is comfort. And where men are conversant with the truth and with the powers of the world to come, there are great consolations. Amen. See, the Holy Spirit brings great consolations 
to men. But to all who are yet unreconciled to God, the Holy Spirit is a great reprover. See, he's consistent in that matter. You see, as the Holy Spirit moves upon the field of humanity, see, to some people he's a, he's, he makes them feel guilty. See, in other people he consoles them. It's great consolations. See, that's, but see that, and, that's, and that's, the, that's the distinction there. The Holy Spirit says, in effect, to unreconciled men, you're in the wrong. Your thoughts are wrong, your actions are wrong, your living is wrong. And if men are yet at a, dwelling at a distance from God to whatever degree, even in the church, the Holy Spirit will reprove them. See, because the Holy Spirit really, he's, he's, he thinks just like God does. He's not willing that any should perish, see? So if, any, if, if there's any departations from God, see, the Holy Spirit will reprove, see? As long as he's not quenched, as long as he's not grieved, see? Now think about this, back in the days of the flood, prior to the days of the flood, the word of the Lord is, God said about his spirit, my spirit shall not always strive with men. Well, that, I just think about that. See, I, I had just kind of thought that in relation to Gen Genesis chapter 6 before, but, but think about all from the beginning. Well, even in the, and this may have been the very thing that provoked men to, to begin to call. Remember it says, back in those days, men began to call on the name of the Lord. See, but, that, but, but no, no doubt there's some, somehow these things are, are fit together. But, but think how the Holy Spirit, see, he is striving with men. Striving with all of humanity. Come to the Savior. Be reconciled to God. But he'll, but he's... But in the, see, the thing what you want to see is that uh, at least in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book of Acts and in the apostolic record, see, we don't have any instances of mysterious workings of the Holy Spirit where he convicted people apart from the preaching of the word. See? So we wanted to vote. Let's, let's be encouraged, brethren, to, to, do, to be filled with the Spirit and, and, to, and to, to preach the word with all boldness. The Holy Spirit's reproof of sin and righteousness and judgment drives the matter home all the more to men's conscience. You see, the, uh, the law of Moses was a reprover of sin and righteousness and judgment. you ever think about that? The law of Moses did the same thing that the Holy Spirit does. It says the law was given that every mouth might be stopped and that all the world might become guilty. Guilty before God! And sin is the transgression of the law. See? But the Holy Spirit, see, now he drives the matter home all the more. And we find men in the book of Acts like Felix and Agrippa, and they're trembling. They're trembling before just mere men that are preaching the word, but they're trembling. Do you think, do you think that Felix was afraid of Paul as a man? No, it was the Holy Spirit that was reproving of sin and righteousness and judgment. And remember, it says that even there that Paul, he, he, was, uh, spe he was reasoning of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing, too. Now think about this matter of the Holy Spirit striving with man, see? Something I, had, this is something I hadn't thought about before either. This, this was even before the days of the calling of Abraham. Before there was such a thing as a Hebrew. No, I'm not saying that facetiously at all. I'm just saying, see, this kind of sheds a, a new light on God's, how, how God so loved the world. That he gave his only, see how God, his love was not just exclusive. You see what I'm saying? He, it was not just exclusively for Israel. See, he was striving with men back in the days of the flood. 
And he continues to strive with men. You don't want to think that, you don't want to see his striving as just being merely like an historical event. Like that's just something that happened in the past. No, that's the way God is. He, he strives with men wherever they are, are at variance with him. Unless he's resisted or grieved. Well, we'll move on further here. There's a lot of talk in our day about the, uh, the Holy Spirit and, and his leading. And we mentioned this in the, in the uh, discussion earlier. They, people talk about leading that's really outside the leading of the Holy Spirit that's outside of the parameters of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. See, that's, I mean, when, when we, see, when we get outside of those parameters, we're really on our own. I mean, whether it's the Holy Spirit or not, it's really open to question, see? Whether his leading in, in these parameters of convent reproving of sin and of righteousness and judgment to come and of bringing men to the world to come. See, his primer, see he's working together with God and the, and the Son to bring men to the world to come. See, when we get outside of those parameters, we're really on our own. See, it's really open to question. I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit or not. See? Amen. And you don't really know either. Now the Holy Spirit can be resisted and grieved and quenched. Think of the Holy Spirit in this matter of resisted. The Holy Spirit's work upon men's heart is a great and mighty influence that works upon men wherever the gospel is preached. But his power and work can be resisted. It's a great and mighty power, but you can resist it. This is the power of God, but you can resist it. Men can resist it. And then with regard to grieving the Holy Spirit, grieve not the Holy Spirit by the which you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit strives with men with great tenderness, seeking to draw the wandering ones back to the Father through the Son, but he most certainly can be grieved. Speaking anthropomorphically, as Sister June was doing a little earlier, the Holy Spirit has feelings. That's speaking as a man. We don't want to bring God down to man's level too much, but, but, but this is, this is the word, these are the words of Scripture, see? And... Uh, The Holy Spirit can be angered, just like God can, see? And he can be quenched. The Holy Spirit's influence upon men's hearts is as a fire that burns everything up in the heart and life that stands between God and men. But this burning is not a conflagration, it is a fire that can be quenched. Now let's move on here. The matter of sin and righteousness uh, and judgment to come. We've spoken of that. Let's talk about the, uh, the, these three things individually. Sin and righteousness and judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Now in this case, the reproof that the Holy Spirit brings is not primarily because men committed this sin or that sin, but rather because they did not believe on the only Savior. That was the reproof. Amen. Sister June uh, mentioned that earlier in her, uh, when she was speaking earlier. You see that? See, we're up to a, well, the Holy Spirit's reproofs bring us up to a higher level of reproof. See? The sin of unbelief, and particularly the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, dwarf all other sins. Adultery, fornication, murder, theft, bearing false witness, coveting, as evil as these sins are, are next to nothing when compared to the rejection of God's salvation. Really, it dwarfs them all. See? This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. 
Not that you broke this, broke this commandment or that, but that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. That was the condemnation. And the Holy Spirit will drive that point home wherever he is not quenched. See? He'll drive it home. Now here's a, uh, a word that we would dedicate to all legalists. Of sin because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit declared, is declared to be re reproving men of sin, not because they failed to measure up to the law or laws, but rather because they did not believe on the Savior, because they did not receive for themselves God's salvation in Christ Jesus. Now here I'm going to give a defini definition of a legalist, and we're going to move ahead more quickly. <clears throat> but this is what a legalist really is. A legalist is really a person who has, he's a religious person who has small thoughts of Christ. That's what he is. Really. He has small thoughts of God's salvation. See, he's, 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 he's got like a bird's eye view of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't see him for who he really is. See, because when, when men see the Lord Jesus Christ for who he really is, they throw off their legalistic bonds. See, they just... They're, the chains just fall off. Amen. Now let's underscore here the absolute importance of faith in the New Covenant era. Where there is no faith, there is no justification. And there is no salvation. Men are yet in their sins. They are guilty and their blood is upon their hands. They stand condemned not before the law's tribunal anymore, but also before the great tribunal, the unseen tribunal that's in the heavens. That's what you want to see. It's of sin because they believe not on me. See, we're talking about a much more serious matter now. I mean, we're not encouraging people to go out and break the law. Don't misunderstand me, but this is a much more serious matter now that Jesus has come, see, of sin because they believe not on me. Amen. We need to have larger thoughts of the Savior and to leave labor to believe on him more perfectly, particularly as this the case in the generation in which we live. The foundations of truth have been destroyed in men's understanding. When you talk to people about the word of God, a lot of times it just bounces off of them. They haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. That's because the foundations have been destroyed. And we have to lay new foundations, see? Got to lay new, some new foundations with, with men, wherever you have opportunity. Tell them what God said. Tell them what the scripture says. Lay some new foundations. In our day, we're f faced with the swelling increase of religious error, of humanism, occults, and the occult. And many of the men and women that we meet daily are not merely unbelievers in Christ. Having heard but not having responded to the gospel, they're souls that have become entangled of religious errors of many sorts. You've got to realize who you're talking to out there. You've got to know what your audience. See? See, see that like 30, 40 years ago, even out there the un, in the unbelieving realm, most, your, most of your audience at least had some knowledge of the Bible, see? So they, had a, they had a grandmother or aunt or somebody that taught them about God's Word, see? But now, a lot of people you talk to out there, they haven't the slightest idea. See, but let's lay the foundations again. Let's, lay the, let's preach the Word and lay the foundation again wherever it's needed. Now he says of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Let's give thanks that the Holy Spirit is not content to stop at the point of convincing men of sin. Jesus Christ is the righteous one and he's gone back into heaven. 
And all, you remember when he was here in this world, just about everybody thought he was the guilty one. They nailed him to a cross. They said he was guilty. But God raised him from the dead. See, and he is, now he is known as Jesus Christ the righteous. See, he is, it's a without question. See, God, if, if, if there was any sin there, or if there was any guilt there, see, God would not have received him back to his right hand. See, but without question, see, he has received his only begotten son. And the Holy Spirit will convince all unbelieving men of an inflexible standard of unrighteousness, of righteousness which is far above them, and which they have miserably come short of, he will drive this matter home to their consciousness as long as he's not quenched. But more than this, he will persuade believing men of a righteousness that is on a much higher plane. It's actually a righteousness that's inside of them now. See that? The it is a righteousness which declares that it was right for God to save them through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now let us say here that wherever you see men and women trembling with great conviction at the pre preaching of the gospel. Now we've seen some of this. See, that's because the prince of this world has been judged. Let's look, let's look beyond, let's look farther than, than just our local circumstance. Let's try to have larger thoughts of what's, what's actually happened here. He says of judgment not because they were convicted of a commandment, he says, because, because the prince of this world is judged. Now let's affirm this again and again with great confidence and, and joy. The prince of this world is judged. Divine sentence has already been passed upon the devil and he knows that he has a short time. And let us look at this another way. What if the prince of this world had not been judged? What do you think the effect would have been? What, unlike when you're preaching the gospel, what would do you, you think? Think you think Felix would have trembled, and Agrippa? If they, do you think they would have trembled, and other men like that, if the prince of this world had not been judged? See, I'm, I'm just asking you to have enlarge your thoughts here of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Well, again, I'm going to ask you to, to consider, brethren, that the, uh, we, we mentioned this at the beginning about the chapters that are in the book of Acts, they're devoted to the Holy Spirit. And like you know, we know that, uh, for example, uh, chapter 8 is in chapter 7, is like devoted to Stephen and, and, th and things of this sort. And do you remember any chapters that were devoted to the Holy Spirit? Brother Seth. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to even take it a step further and say that all of them are. See, all of them are. See, it's as, see, as, see the Holy Spirit is working through men, all through the book of Acts. See, he's, he's reproving men of sin and righteousness and judgment, all through the book of Acts, and, and all down through the centuries, and all down into the, into the Calumet region, and all through the world, wherever the gospel is preached. See? So I'm encouraging you, brethren, to... to to be encouraged and to preach the word with all boldness. Now this matter of uh, conviction, this is going to be our concluding thought. And I promise this will be. You know that there's that old spiritual. It's where, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes causes me to tremble, tremble. He's talking about this Holy Spirit reproving men of sin and righteousness and judgment. Sometimes it causes me to tremble. Oh, see, and the Holy Spirit can transport your thoughts back to the cross, see, and back to the things that happened back there, and then back up to the end. See, he can, see, the Holy Spirit, he can, he can transport you in your thoughts to these th different things that God has said in his word. 
But as, a, as our final thought, I'm going to ask that you stand, and we're going to sing that. We're going to sing it together. I think we all know that. We're just going to sing that one verse. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you, were you there? Let's start again. I'm on the wrong key. Were you, were you, you there when they crucified my Lord?